Maybe all I need is Girl Scout cookies and wine And all I need is you of my mind One more box of Girl Scout cookies and wine Obviously, all of the, the methods that have been used to apprehend the killer have not been successful. The financial rewards that have been offered have not been successful in, in the killer coming forward or anybody that knows definitive information coming forward. From what you see and what you know, will the case be solved? I rather doubt it. It's been too long. And so the mystery goes on. One cold winter day on February 25th, 1975, while delivering Girl Scout cookies, nine-year-old Marsha Virginia Trimble from Nashville, Tennessee, vanished into thin air. Her body was found 33 days later sticking out from a plastic wading pool in a neighbor's shed. Her case would remain one of Nashville's most notorious and mysterious cold cases. 33 years later, her assailant would finally be arrested. Hello, my name is Holly. Welcome to the Murder She Shed, the place we honor the dead right from my little she shed. Just make sure to wiggle your finger down. Actually, you go down. Mine's probably up to the subscribe button to hear rarely heard, rarely discussed true crimes right here in my little she shed. Love to have you. Come join me and all my subscribers. I'm growing just slowly, but I'm got about 3,600 something subscribers. We're getting there. We're getting word out hopefully. And thanks for supporting my channel you guys that do. Really enjoy your comments. And I love to hear from where you're from and everything. And I love to hear what your opinion is on each and every story. Anyway, enough of that. Girl Scouts started selling cookies for profit as early as 1917, only five years after the Girl Scouts were founded. In the 1920s and 1930s, Scouts would bake their own cookies and just sell them door to door to all their neighbors, friends, family. Because of Marsha Trimble's death, parents began to realize the dangers of selling door to door and now often just set up booths in front of stores and their parents are usually with them so they can sell these amazing cookies. Okay, I'm going to say it. Thin mint are my weaknesses. I could eat usually a whole package, probably in one setting with some cold milk. Just my weakness. I'm not going to lie about it. Which one's your favorite? When you buy a box of Girl Scout cookies, you're helping a girl explore a career and giving her a chance to make new friends. You're helping her learn water safety or photography or the value of service to others. Cookie Money stays in your locality and provides opportunities to Girl Scouts in your neighborhood. So when you buy Girl Scout cookies, you're investing in your community through a girl. And you're getting a great box of cookies. The Trimble family lived in Green Hill, an affluent suburb of Nashville. For Marsha and the many other children who roam freely through the pleasant neighborhood, it was a comfortable and safe place to live. People who knew Marsha described her as a happy and tender-hearted little girl who was very well liked. She enjoyed childhood pastimes such as riding her bike, roller skating, playing with Barbie dolls, and watching Little House on the Prairie. Marsha was a fourth grader at Julia Green Elementary School. She was not only a bright little girl, but she was also very beautiful. Girl Scouts was Marsha's way of making new friends and learning new activities. Marsha's parents were just recently separated due to her father's struggle with alcohol. However, there was no indication of domestic violence. So Girl Scouts was taking her mind off of what was going on at home. On February 25, 1975, 9-year-old Marsha Trimble came home from school, watched Gilligan's Island for a bit and ate a snack before she went out to deliver Girl Scout cookies. It was Marcia's first year as a scout, and she was so excited about her first time getting to sell those cookies. Her mother, Virginia, was the leader of her troop, number 802. After she finished her snack, Marcia went out with her cookie carton and met Marge Egerton coming from his house. He lived just a few doors down from the Trembles. 
The 10-year-old boy was a classmate at her school and a friend to both Marcia and her 12-year-old brother, Chuck. For a while, March accompanied Marcia through the neighborhood. After selling a few boxes, she saw that her grandmother had pulled up in her driveway at her house. So she knew grandmas are always good for a good sale. So she went home to sell to her grandmother because grandmothers are always your best customers, right? She had her coat after going to her room for some more boxes. After selling some to her grandma, she then said, I'm headed to Miss Maxwell's house to sell some cookies. The Maxwell's house was just across the street, so she didn't grab her coat and told her mother she'd be just right back. Her friend March didn't want to go since he was now playing basketball with her older brother Chuck. That afternoon, Miss Maxwell had just returned from a birthday party. When Miss Maxwell turned into her driveway at 5.30 p.m., she saw three figures standing in the shadows by her neighbor's garage. One she did recognize as Marcia, and Marcia was facing away from her. One of the others appeared to be a smaller figure, perhaps a child. And the third was a tall figure in a long, dark overcoat. I don't know about you, but I was always taught that trench coats, overcoats, that was just something perverts wore that flashed you, so... You should really stay away from those. But apparently, maybe Marcia didn't learn the rules of that in the 80s. But maybe Miss Maxwell didn't know either because, yeah, that, that's just something we tried to stay away from. Because too many people went on yet back then. Or at least that's what I felt like everybody said. They got flashed when people were wearing trench coats. I don't know if this is the truth. You know, the 80s. Assuming that Marcia would be over any second with her cookies, she decided she'd run inside and get her checkbook. But when Miss Maxwell heard their family dog Daisy barking furiously at the rear of their property towards the woods, she just figured that Marcia had walked up the path through the woods to the Thorpe's house to deliver their cookies first. But she wondered why the dog was making such a fuss. She'd never heard Daisy bark like that at Marcia. When Marcia wasn't back by dinner time, her family began to search the neighborhood. Marcia's mom went inside and telephoned Miss Maxwell, since the last thing Marcia had said as she ran out the door that she was headed to Miss Maxwell's house. Miss Maxwell let her know about the last time she had actually saw her talking to some people at her neighbor's house. This creepy man in a trench coat and another child perhaps. Eventually, Marcia's two dogs that had went with her across the road returned, but without Marcia, which was really weird, the family thought, because these dogs went everywhere with Marcia. They, they followed her everywhere, and they came back by themselves. So she said, I think I better call authorities, and that's exactly what they did. Authorities quickly started searching for Marcia. By 9 p.m., an intense search of the neighborhood was underway. Neighbors on Copeland and residents of the wider area who had heard about Marcia joined the search, but with no success. Sometime during the night that Marcia had disappeared, Marcia's mother went into Marcia's bedroom and got down on her knees and just started praying to God that God would bring her back safely. She was so worried. She's a very religious woman. So she just started praying. She thought at that time that's all she could do. She didn't know what else to do. It was night. It was cold. And she was scared. Officers took statements from the neighbors, made calls, answered calls, and followed leads. From the children in the neighborhood, one name kept popping up. That name was 15-year-old neighbor Jeffrey Womack. The police and neighbors had been to the Womack's house, but Jeffrey actually wasn't home when they got there. Then at around 9.45 p.m., he appeared at the Trimble house. He said he and her police were looking for him, so that's why he showed up. Jeffrey worked part-time for Peggy, a divorced woman in her early 30s who actually ran a daycare on that street. They learned that Peggy had been at the bowling alley while Jeffrey was supposedly watching all the daycare children. The first thing authorities noticed was Jeffrey's shoes, which are kind of bizarre. He had written F.U. across them. They took Jeffrey inside the Womack's house to interview him. 
They explained his rights to him and then told him they needed all the information he could muster up about Marsha. Jeffrey agreed to empty his pockets. He placed up on the bed a $5 bill, some change, and a partial roll of pennies in a red wrapper. One of the detectives checked the coat pockets with Jeffrey's consent and also removed a package of condoms. The officers asked where he'd been, and Jeffrey said he'd been out searching for Marsha at the nearby rock quarry. They asked about the condoms. He said he had bought them for a Saturday night concert. Although they would later find out, 15-year-old Jeffrey was sleeping with his 32-year-old boss, Peggy. The one he worked for at the daycare? Yeah, that one. Jeffrey confirmed that Marsha came to his house about 4.30 p.m. with cookies. But he hadn't any money then, so she'd left and he didn't know where she actually went. Jeffrey was able to pass two polygraph tests. Maxwell also told police about the last time she had saw Marsha. By the time Easter rolled around, Virginia, being a deeply religious woman, felt that would be the day on Easter that her daughter would come home to her. Good Friday would be Marcia's 10th birthday. On March 30th, 1975, Easter morning, Marcia would be found, but not in the way her mother would have liked her to be found. The Thorpe family, remember the ones that lived out in the woods? They were a little ways from the Trimble's house, but they had guests over for Easter day. John Thorpe had agreed to sell his brother-in-law, Harry, a boat motor, and it was out in the old shed. And he said, and there's some old tires out there. You can have those if you'd like. And he just used this old shed for extra storage. So Harry went outside to look in the shed. He spotted the boat motor just sitting on an old toilet seat. He also decided he would try to locate the tire. He maneuvered through the junk, heading toward the rear wall to get a look at the tires. He was facing the left corner of the garage. Watching his step, he saw what he first thought was a doll's face. But he knew in one heart-stopping moment that it was not a doll. The body of a little girl lay face up in the corner with her right arm across her blue and white checked blouse. He knew instantly it was most likely the little girl who had been missing now for 33 days. He decided to just call John out to the shed without alerting the women or children. John crossed the yard with Harry. He later noted that Harry looked very pale. When they reached the garage, Harry said, Think I've found a body back here. The men made their way through the clutter. Harry indicated a toy swimming pool turned upside down, obscuring part of the body. He said, Please tell me that's not that girl's body over there in the corner. John said, I think it's a doll. Her blonde hair was tangled in a basketball go. Harry pointed out dark colored marks around her mouth and neck. A few inches of skin were exposed between the blouse and blue jeans. John took a long handled broom from the wall and used the handle to touch her arm to see if it was real. He had hoped it would feel like a wooden doll, but it didn't. The men did not have to say anything more to each other. They left the garage and returned to the house. John immediately called 911. The Thorpe, saddened and shocked by the death of the neighbor child, could not fathom how she had been discovered in their shed. The search was over. Now Marsha's family had to find the strength to get through the days ahead and find out what monster could have done this to their little girl. When the ME and forensic investigators arrived, they noticed Marsha's body was lying on top of a bag of fertilizer in a woven basket. Partially covering her legs were an old sheet, a bedspread, and a canvas shower curtain. Her clothes were intact and her boots were zipped up. In her right hand was a small piece of cord. She was wearing violet-colored nail polish that had begun to chip. On top of her body was a green glass jar, and her cookie carton and six boxes of cookies were scattered all over her in the wall. The envelope that had once contained cookie money was now empty. The amount had only been $15. After the autopsy, the ME believed Marcia had only been dead 10 or 15 days, but she'd been missing 33 days. Did someone keep her alive somewhere? Then after death, bring her back close to where they'd actually picked her up. Her manner of death was being strangled by hands, and she was assayed. 
Then he said Marcia had eaten a small green pear two to three hours before her death. More proof that she had been held alive somewhere. The ME would come back later in the investigation and say she had died directly after her disappearance. He said because of the cold temperatures, she could have been in that shed that long without any decomp. Also, since Marcia's mom had plenty of fruit in the house, she could have just grabbed one as she's going out the door, grabbed a pear. Although the Thorpe still said she could not have been in that shed that whole time because they've been in there several times and they'd never seen her at all. Also, cadaver dogs were sent out, and if Marcia was in the shed the whole time, they felt like they would have found her. The authorities still had Jeffrey as their number one suspect. And by 1979, when Jeffrey was 19, he was arrested for Marcia's murder. He was given three more polygraph tests, five total, and he passed every single one. Yet authorities were saying, it's a teenager that did this, and I really believe that it's Jeffrey. They were determined that it was a teenager. Several hours after the arrest, Jeffrey appeared before the judge and was charged with first-degree murder. The judge set him free on $25,000 bond. Yet if they were clinging to the theory that her body was brought to the garage only a few days prior to its discovery, how could Jeffrey be the killer? I mean, he was a teenager without a car, living with his parents. Where in the world would he have kept this little girl alive all that time? Even Virginia, Marcia's mom, had her doubts that Jeffrey was even the killer. The only evidence that authorities had to go by was hearsay from the other children that they said they heard Jeffrey admit to Marcia's murder. They didn't know if he was joking or not, but he had admitted to it. All they had was hearsay for proof that he murdered these, this child in five polygraph tests that he passed. No one has ever been able to explain uh, why the search dogs from Philadelphia who were uh, right at the uh, Thorpe garage where Marsha's body was later found, uh, uh, didn't uh, notice anything. And uh, I think their handler was quoted in the news media saying perhaps it was because there had been so much activity and, and so many people walking through the neighborhood. That's an interesting aspect of the case. These dogs were about the best in yes. the world, I guess. Yes. They had gone to that garage on Estes before, hadn't they? Yes, yes. There had been other dogs. There had been uh, dogs from the Metro Police Department, but these were special dogs uh, from Philadelphia that did not go in the garage, but passed within feet of it on many occasions. As you, as you reconstruct the events, and, and I want to say right off that, that this is not fact, this is supposition, but as you look at all the physical uh, evidence and all the testimony, what do you think was the scenario? What were the events in order leading up to the finding of her body? Well, Teddy, I've never thought, and my partner, Mr. Yarbrough, who worked on this case with me, has never thought that uh, Marcia was in that garage the entire time. I've interviewed, and Mr. Yarbrough has interviewed many witnesses who swear that they were in the garage. Uh, uh, some seasoned police officers, uh, uh, some people who were with the... Uh, uh, volunteer civil defense search team uh, and they can tell you the places that they searched uh, I think when Marsha's body was finally found it was on top of uh, some fertilizer sacks these police officers even described the fertilizer sacks that they saw in there but the most convincing uh, witness uh, to me was the uh, mother of the owner of the garage where Marsha Trumbull was found I talked to this nice lady uh, shortly after Jeffrey's arrest. She was in the garage with her daughter-in-law Tuesday before Marsha's body was found on Easter Sunday, which I believe was March the 4th, 1975. She was looking for some flower pots. She was looking in the exact corner of the garage where Marsha's body was found. And this nice lady was afraid of snakes and rats, so she had taken a, a German shepherd dog in there with her. And the dog was also with her in the uh, corner of the garage where uh, the child's body was found. It's just impossible for me to believe that all these people would have missed the body. So your, your belief then is that someone placed the body in that garage shortly before it was found. Is that right? Uh, that's the most reasonable uh, thing for me to believe. Because of lack of evidence, the case was never brought to the grand jury and the case against Jeffrey was actually dropped. 
Everyone began to doubt the case would ever be solved because the only DNA that they'd actually found was such a small amount and it was not preserved correctly. This added to further speculation that it would ever be solved. But this was way before advancement of DNA technology. By 1990, the advancement in DNA had come a long ways. So authorities opened Marsha's case again and was able to get search warrants for all the DNA of all the young boys that lived in Marsha's neighborhood. Still thinking it was a teenager, Jeffrey being one of those boys. There was no match to anyone that had been tested in the neighborhood. In 2007, a breakthrough occurred when a detective actually found additional DNA on the old sheet that had been located on Marsha's body. The DNA was added to the new CODIS system database that hadn't been around until 1998. The news came back that Marsha's murder matched the DNA of a suspect in another murder. The murder of 19-year-old Sarah Desperez from Nashville, Tennessee, happened only 23 days before Marsha's murder. Sarah was a sophomore at Vanderbilt University, where her father was a professor of medicine at that university. Bright, pretty, and spirited, Sarah, or Sally, as her family and friends called her, enjoyed classical music and had a reputation as an accomplished pianist. Sarah only lived a block from the university in a tiny little apartment. Sarah added a small decoration to her apartment, a black and brown German Shepherd puppy that she named Tex. Well, I can't blame her. They do make for beautiful decorations. Sarah worked nights and didn't want to leave Tex by himself. On Saturday, February 1st, 1975, Sarah was excited that night about going out on a date with a senior from her university. First, her and her date, her male, went to the movies and then to a fraternity house after party. But her neighbor, Lynn Fussell, offered to keep Tex at night while Sarah worked, and it was a good arrangement for all three then. So whenever the puppy stayed over with Lynn, Sarah would pick him up between 6 and 7 in the morning. Personally, I don't know how she worked nights and then was able to watch this puppy in the day because German Shepherds are like toddlers on crack. They got so much energy. But anyway, she decided to watch this puppy the night that Sarah went to that party. And when Sarah was at the party, she had a little too much to drink and she felt sick, so she wanted to come home. Tramiel drove her home and dropped her off. Sarah's apartment was actually on the third floor, but she told Tramiel, don't worry about walking me up, I'll just go on up. By 11 the next day, Sarah had not picked up her dog from Lynn's house, and it was very hungry, so Lynn decided to go into Sarah's apartment for dog food. She had a key, and she took the dog with her. From the kitchen, Lynn could see Sarah lying on the bed, in her bedroom, sheets in disarray, but Lynn just figured Sarah had a late night, and just wouldn't want to be bothered. She found the dog food and just started to leave. When she called for Tex though, the dog came out of the bedroom and he was slinking and whining. Lynn paused wondering why Tex was acting like that, but she didn't stick around to find out. She ordered Tex out, locked the door, and returned to her apartment with the dog food. I want to tell you right now, you should always listen to a dog. Dogs have the sixth sense. They just know. Dogs know. So, Anytime your yeah, dogs are acting strange, you need to pick up on that. Because I know that they, they could save your life, really. About 3.30 Sunday afternoon, Tex was hungry again. So, Lynn just returned to Sarah's apartment to get more dog food. Assuming Sarah was still asleep, Lynn didn't even look in the bedroom this time. By 9, Sunday night, Sarah had not come to get Tex still. Lynn considered waking her since Sarah was actually doing her job at the dormitory at 11 p.m., but she didn't. When Sarah didn't show up for work, her work called her dead. This was not like Sarah. The doctor wondered what could be wrong to make his daughter miss her work and not call in. He decided to go to her apartment. Sarah was found lying on her bed in a tangle of bed linens wearing only her blouse. Her face was bruised. She had no pulse. The doctor tried to get her breathing again, but she was dead. He quickly called the police. The SAM murder of co-ed Sarah sent shockwaves throughout the Vanderbilt University campus. The Vanderbilt campus was only five miles from where Marsha had been murdered, but the two murders had never been tied together. The suspect would finally be caught 
after an attempted break-in at the home of a special education teacher named Judy Ladd. She actually listened to her little chihuahua. She listened to her dog, and that saved her life that night because he refused to quit barking, and he alerted her to the man that was fixing to come into her screen door. Judy happened to have a weapon, so she went and grabbed it in on her bedroom, and she threatened the man, you come in here, I'm using this. And so she was able to persuade him not to come through the door. He was caught while trying to evade arrest for this attempted break-in and then arrested. After he was arrested, he had been suspected of a string of essays that had occurred on college campuses. Authorities got a search warrant to actually search the suspect's house where they found jewelry and other items that had been stolen from his victim's home, his victim's home. The suspects for the women that had been assaulted on the campus had finally been caught. The suspect was Jerome Sidney Barrett, a 26-year-old, 6-foot, 2-inch tall black male from Memphis. Barrett said he was a messenger sent by the Nation of Islam, and he was ordered to break in and assault these women. Barrett was arrested in March of 1975 for the essays of several women and released by 2002 and was never connected to the murders of Marsha or Sarah at that time. In 2007, because of advancement in DNA technology, these two murders would finally be solved and the families of these victims would finally get justice. When officers had went back to investigate Sarah's murder and able to find some DNA off the sheets on her bed, They remembered all the essays that had happened to college girls around that same time in that area that Sarah had been murdered. They wondered if they might be linked, but they needed DNA from Barrett in order to find out. His DNA had never been put into the new CODIS system, and he was already out of prison by the time, you know, they had started that. He had already, he was still in and never put his DNA in. I mean, a miracle happened, and he actually allowed them to have his DNA without a fight. Barrett's DNA came back as the match for the DNA found at the crime scene of Sarah's murder. And then after actually putting that same DNA into CODIS, Marsha's murder was finally solved after 33 years. Barrett, at 62 years age, was found guilty on second-degree murder charges. The jury fixed his punishment at 44 years in the penitentiary. 2014, Marsha's mother, Virginia, wanted to look at her daughter's crime scene photos. She had never wanted to see them before. Her husband actually advised her not to because they were so bad. She said her daughter's face and head was swollen. It didn't look like Marsha at all. But to see her other parts of her body did look like Marsha. She said her daughter had vomit across her. Her hair was pulled out in parts and there was blood on her scalp. And at that moment, if she had had something she would have killed the guy she was so mad it made her mad but it also healed her she felt the healing of her finally seeing these pictures she felt like she could finally heal i mean i don't know if it made her say hey she she is gone made her feel she wasn't ever allowed to look at her i just guess it just healed her anyway whatever the case i'm glad it was able to heal her some and i'm fine i'm glad the family finally found some kind of justice And also that Sarah and Marsha was able to find justice. I hope they rest in peace. It's just sad that it took so many years to solve this. And they tried to blame teenagers. And yet, this guy was sitting in front of them all along. They just didn't put it together because they were so focused on these teenagers. But at least it was finally solved. All right, guys. I actually did a video yesterday. I may tie in those bloopers. The volume messed up. I keep doing that, but Simon's actually on that video, so I may tie those bloopers in. And of course, as usual, I'll leave y'all bloopers so I don't leave y'all sad. And I do love y'all, and I hope y'all have a blessed week. And hey, get the word out that the Southern girls right here in the murder she shed burning up for y'all. Sweating, sweating like a Texas. I don't know. Anyway, you should tell somebody. So I'll have to sweat alone in here. All right. Love y'all. Bye. Her case would remain one of Nashville's, Nashville's, it's not Nashville, a bedspread and a canvas shower curtain. Her clothes were, oh God, Simon, (laughs) you scared the pee out of me, boy. (laughs) I wasn't expecting to just 
jump through the doors like that. <laughs> right in the middle of a tense moment, he jumps through the door. You're a beautiful decoration. I love you as a decoration, my friend. 15-year-old Jeffrey was sleeping with his 32-year-old wife, Peggy. What kind of daycare is this? She sleeps with the miners at her daycare. And you can see me and Simon, back there, Simon, telling you rarely heard true crime tales right from our she shed. Oh, what, what more could you want? Oh no, I got him excited when I did that. That's an exciting thing, apparently. It's a big